got a couple of guests who are going to be joining us uh, over the course of the next 40 minutes, and, and we're, we're talking about what has remained. And I noticed this from my own position as a talk show host, the feedback I get. Uh, the governor's veto of the grocery tax repeal bill has gotten well. I've had some people tell me that they're okay with the veto, um, that they understood his position. I've had other people, on the other hand, who are scratching their heads over this one. What's interesting to note is there was broad support for the uh, repeal among both Republicans and Democrats and in both the House and the Senate. And we're joined this morning by first by Brian Zollinger, who's a Republican member of the House, as well as in about 15 minutes we'll be joined by a little over 15 minutes by Michelle Stanett. She's the leader of the Democrats in the state Senate, and they're both going to be reflecting on this and maybe what's next. Uh, first of all, Brian, welcome to our program, sir. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate you having me on. Right off the top, you were talking about taking this thing to court because there's a belief among some Republicans that the governor was late in his veto and therefore that the law should take effect. That, that's correct. In fact, we filed, we mailed, overnight mailed yesterday, the, uh, the petition for writ of mandamus uh, requesting the court to decide or to demand the Secretary of State um, certify House Bill 67, which is a grocery tax repeal, into law. And then, so we filed that yesterday. Now, at this stage of the game, uh, you're looking back at that 1978 court decision, which was his justification that it's 10 days after it gets to his desk and not 10 days after it's sent to his office. Uh, there's some disagreement over what that court decision means, and some of you believe that it, it, it could be fought constitutionally. That's at least my understanding. That, that's exactly right. The, the Constitution is very clear. It's plain meaning. It says 10 days after adjournment. Now, if it's the five days while we're in session, that says from presentment. What the 1978 court case did, the, uh, Senator, they call it the Santa Rosa decision. What that, that court, based on a hypothetical set of facts, said, well, what if the uh, legislature plays games and they hold on to a bill for 10 days after adjournment? That can't happen, so we need to... Make, Change the plain meaning of the word adjournment to, to mean the same as presentment. And so they interpreted that the governor also had 10 days after uh, adjournment. So 10 days after presentment of the bill. In this case, we adjourned on March 29th. The bill wasn't presented to the governor until March 31st. Uh, so the deadline to, to veto that was April 10th, and he vetoed it on April 11th. So we think the plain meaning of the Constitution should rule. Uh, and there's several... You want to get into it? There's several reasons why I think today the makeup of today's court will uh, favors our position, actually. And, and and that is because I guess we've had uh, what uh, people who've been appointed or who've actually taken uh, been elected and that have a vastly different outlook about all of this than let's say they did 40 years ago. Yeah, I think that's it. You know, I, I obviously wasn't around in 1978 to see uh, why that court did what it did. Uh, you can say two of the three in the majority, were appointed by uh, Governor Andrus. Perhaps that had something to do with it. You'd like to think not. But really what we have today are five judges who have proven themselves to be uh, textualists, that they believe in the plain meaning, meaning of the law, and they're not willing to be activist judges and change the plain meaning because it suits their needs. Uh, this, this can be evidenced by, just in the last five years, there have been two major Supreme Court cases that have overturned 20-plus years of precedent. One was just this past year with attorney fees, where they weren't shy about saying, look, these past courts have based the facts on hypotheticals, and the plain meaning is this, and they've overturned precedent. So I think they're ready for this uh, to, to make people more hopeful that are cheering for the grocery tax repeal. In 2015, you had the Indian tribe, the uh, instant racing Supreme Court case, quarter line tribe versus Denny, with a late veto. And in that decision, uh, or in a concurring position, uh, Part, Justice Eisman and Justin Warren Jones concurring said, and I don't have the quote, but basically the sentence started, unfortunately, the 1978 case decided, he decided to ignore the plain meaning of the Constitution and base their decision on a hypothetical set of facts that didn't exist. So I, I, to me, they're, they're teeing it up. I think this court is waiting for this case to overturn the precedent, the activism that occurred in 1978. I was talking to one of your colleagues last Friday uh, afternoon, and he was telling me that your background is constitutional law. So uh, you're not coming at this from just hope. You're coming from a background where you think you have a, 
obviously some some ground to stand on. A- absolutely, that's you know I've argued in front of the Idaho Supreme Court, uh, I believe eight times now. Just and uh, you know I have a good feel for the justices. I've read several decisions. I'm in, I'm educated on the Constitution, and uh, I, I don't think there's any disagreement. Even that 1978 court case said the plain meaning of the Constitution is 10 days after adjournment. And so uh, I really, you know, I'd, I can't put odds on it, but I really think we're going to win this. And I think it shows in uh, yesterday when we filed the petition, we had 30 uh, legislators join us in this petition. Now, when you bring this up, if you end up winning, what happens then? I mean, it's not that the repeal doesn't take effect immediately, right? That's correct. So what would happen if we win, uh, the Supreme Court would in, uh, order, issue the writ of mandamus, ordering the Secretary of State to certify House Bill 67 into law. My estimate timeline, uh, that could happen as quick as two weeks if the Supreme Court decides they don't want to hold oral argument on this, but most likely this fall, probably August, they'll answer that. Then there, there's three different deadlines contained in the grocery tax repeal bill. The first one is uh, the credit goes away January 1st, 2018. Then the grocery tax uh, itself goes away, I believe it's June 1st, 2018. And then the whole thing goes into place, the new revenue distribution schemes between the cities and everything, I believe July 1st, 2018. So there are three separate deadlines. Now, when you mentioned you have 30 legislators who got on board with you, I know beginning of last week it seemed like they were just a a handful of you, uh, yet it was overwhelming, the support for the repeal. Are you surprised more haven't gotten on board, obviously in your own party and across the aisle? You know, I, I, I'm not. First of all, um, we maybe could have pushed it with the, the Democrats. I mean, it's like you said, this had bipartisan support. Um, I read in the news, in the, in the media from uh, the minority leader that they weren't interested in pursuing the veto, so we really didn't push on getting any Democrats. Uh, Republicans, there were some games going on behind the scenes. Uh, people calling, saying they had a better plan than trying to take this to court. And unfortunately, they convinced uh, a few that, in fact, we had three or four back out on us at the last minute because they've spoken with others who uh, claimed to have a better plan. I, I don't know what that is yet, but that was the claim. So not not really surprised. 914, our guest is uh, Brian Zollinger, state representative here in Idaho, uh, actually comes from eastern Idaho and uh we want to point out we're at 44 on top story with Bill Colley on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News 1310.com. Now, when when you mention they have another idea, my impression has been it's wait until next year, just introduce it earlier. That way, if there's a veto, veto you have time before the end of session to actually pass it. So it's just postponing it another 12 months. Well, that that's what I would have thought too, but we received calls yesterday uh, as we were filing this from different individuals saying that uh, there were people pushing for a special session to get some um, broader tax relief. Uh, my perspective is that's true, and we can get a special session and maybe get some income tax relief like the bills that died this year. Uh, that would be a good thing, but I didn't see any reason to delay the petition. I think if, if we can really get a special session and work on the overall tax policy, uh, I think us filing the petition just puts more pressure on them to get, get that done if, if they're really that concerned about us winning in court. Well, you're working with a group of people, and I know a few weeks ago you got a lot of attention around the state and in media and within the party because uh, you and a colleague have proposed setting up something called the Freedom Caucus, modeled on the one with the House of Representatives in Washington, and... Uh, I, I guess there's probably people who are looking at that saying, what's that all about? And then wondering if they should ally with your cause or should they come at this from another direction? That that could be. And uh, w- what we had join us, the 20, um, 24 representatives that are in this petition, um, I believe all showed up for our Freedom Caucus meeting. And, uh, you know, if you look at voting records, the 24 of us, and then there, there's a few more, normally vote together. So, to me, that is uh, the Freedom Caucus. And, of course, we're all Republicans, and we want 99% of the same thing. So we really don't want the Freedom Caucus to divide anybody. Uh, our, our intent will, it'll be more of a discussion group, and we'll go over the Republican Party platform and discuss the bills as they relate to that and see if we can fix some of the uh, 
voting problems a few of our Republican caucus members have. Now, when when you when you go this direction, and of course you mentioned twenty four, that's more than uh, a third of the of the uh, the entire uh, House because what you've got seventy members total. Yeah, that's correct. And yeah. so those are all Republicans. So it's actually probably a larger number of Republicans, maybe. Uh, because no Democrats obviously are interested in being yeah. in your Freedom Caucus, <laughs> so it's a, you're off to a pretty good start, I would imagine, with that. And uh, it, does the public need to apply some pressure, at least in the sense of telling their own members of the House that this is not a bad idea to get behind this Freedom Caucus, as well as your approach to the uh, to the repeal? Yeah, I think on the on the repeal, absolutely, uh, everybody needs to get behind that and push their representatives. Now, to be fair, there were a few that uh, contacted me right after we filed the petition that wanted on. We didn't get their names on. Um, as to the Freedom Caucus, I, I would encourage people to press their representatives to join our cause there, too. More importantly, the overall picture is just to get their representatives. The people need to pay attention to how their representatives are voting. Look at their uh, – there's not a lot of metrics out there. The American Conservative Union has a metric they put out year-end. Uh, Idaho Freedom Foundation has a – a freedom index they put out, and I would encourage people to look at those indexes, see what the representatives are doing, and, and then talk to them. And that's kind of our goal with the Freedom Caucus, is we're going to, like I said, just follow the Republican Party platform that's given to us by the people of the state and encourage other legislators that have maybe lost their way a little bit to, to come back home and follow those Republican principles that they campaigned on. Uh, we've got about a minute to go. That uh, Idaho Freedom Foundation, along with a uh, a report they put out about some of the governor's vetoes this year that got picked up by the Washington Examiner, and uh, their question is, "What's become?" I think they asked if which otter had been kidnapped by aliens. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> do, <laughs> what, what, do you have a feeling that he has changed his political philosophy? Uh, there, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. If you read, uh, I mean, Butch Otter used to write for uh, the John Birch Society. I'm trying to think their their magazine, The New American. I mean, he had articles in the New American. His he had quotations in uh, 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 Ezra Taft Benson's pamphlet on the proper role of government. The cover page had a quote from Butch Otter, and and you look at what he's doing now, and he's going not only against people but any tax relief. And the budget he proposed to us this year was almost a nine percent increase. That that is not conservative. So there, there's no doubt for some reason he's lost his way. Well, Brian, I want to thank you for your time this morning. And uh, when we have a decision from the court, uh, we hope to talk again. It sounds great, Bill. Appreciate you having me on. Thanks for all you do. All right, and take care, sir. Uh, Brian Zollinger joining us this morning, state representative, uh, joining us from the area around uh, Idaho Falls, uh, taking a few minutes with us this morning on Top Story. And as he said, they have, uh, they're have filing suit, and they hope that they, uh, that they will overturn a 1978 case, and that will then... Uh, overturn the governor's veto of the grocery tax repeal, and the grocery tax repeal then would end up taking effect. We're going to be talking to uh, State Senator Michelle Stennett in just a few minutes. Uh, she's going to offer us the thoughts from uh, the Democrat side of the uh, the caucus right here on News Radio 1310, KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com.